for being a minute late. We were just wrapping up at Margot's chat and Margot's talk. So <clears throat> I can't see any of you. So if all of you could just quickly um, drop in the chat where you are calling in from or joining us today, that would be wonderful. And we'll get started in just a moment. So here is the chat. Uh, let me start it. Um, this is the session chat. Yousef from Chicago, wonderful. So just so you know, there are two tabs here. Um, the event tab would make you post in, uh, what you post would make, would be visible for everyone. Whereas if you click on the session tab, that's from, uh, that's for just us at the, this session. So how did you like Margot's talk? Feel free to drop your response to the chat. Got, okay, so in the interest of time, we'll get started in a moment. So let me just welcome all the presenters to the stage really quickly. Um, so the first presenter will be Abi. Abi, are you here? Um, okay, the second is Yousef, then Aman, Mirika, and Avinash. So I don't, I see Avinash, I see Yousef. Got it. And let me make sure. Oh, got it. Okay, it's Abhishek. Wonderful. So let us get started. So the way we'll run this, the first um, eight minutes will be the talk by each student. And then there will be two minutes of questions. And I'll leave the stage and rejoin two minutes before your time is up. That will be an indication to you that uh, it's time to wrap up your talk. So let me start by sharing the stage with Abi. And... Um, Abhishek, thank Hello. you. Yeah, wonderful. So um, I'm so excited to welcome our first speaker in this session today, Abi. As you all know, at this symposium, we have a, an incredible array of speakers and presentations reflecting all the hard work done by our students, and th th that's you. And thank you so much for everyone who has uh, who, who, who joined us today. It's always important to cheer on our wonderful scholars and um, to, sh to help them share their knowledge with us and ask questions. So feel free to ask questions as we get started. So about Abi, Abi is a student at Newark Academy from Short Hills, New Jersey from the US. And with that, I will give, I yield the stage to Abi and Abi, please share your screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes, wonderful. Let me leave the stage and please get started. All right. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Abhi Vardarajan. Uh, my mentor was C.B. Garrett and my project was focused on game planning for offenses in the National Football League in the U.S. So, to start, um, I got the idea for this project when I was watching the New York Giants play their games last year because the Giants are my favorite team living in New Jersey. And so I noticed that their offense was very bad. It was among the worst in the league in many categories. They couldn't generate points, and it ended up costing them a shot at the playoffs in a very poor division that they should have won last year. So obviously, there are for every problem, there is a solution. And I had to think about what the solutions to the problem could be. and. The two solutions I came up with were either that the roster was deficient in talent or that the game plan was lacking. And to be honest, it was probably a little bit of both. And since in this offseason, the Giants front office made a lot of big improvements to their offensive talent, I decided that I would attack this problem from the game planning aspect of things. So obviously to create a game plan involves some research. And there were two steps in terms of the research and then one step to compile it into a, into a fully fledged game plan. So to start, I would watch film 
of the team from last year, as well as some new players they added in the off season to see what each individual player's strengths were. And from each um, play that I would watch, I would notice different things and I would note them down. And then once I was done with watching the game, I would uh, look at what the general trends were and I would then compile these into um, a folder with every a note on every single player's strengths and weaknesses. And after that, I would look at statistics to inform these claims to make sure that these weren't just one-off trends in each individual game, but rather they were, uh, they were trends for the whole season um, instead of just that one game. And the last step would be to consider how I could use these strengths in an actual concept on the field that would make the offense more effective by using all these players' strengths to combine and work off of each other in a way that would make it difficult for defenses to defend against the Giants. So to start out, there is some film study that, would, that had to be done, and I'll just take you guys through one play of a Giants game from last season to tell you what I would notice from their, their games. So to start off, uh, so first, what I notice here is that the Giants are setting up for what looks like a run play because they have a lot of players on the offensive line, indicating that they're trying to block a lot of defenders, which is also indicated by the Pittsburgh Steelers putting a lot of people in the box, indicating that they're going to rush the quarterback very intensely. I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight players out of 11 that look like they could be rushing the quarterback or attempting to stuff the run. And as you can see, the running back looks like he's going to take the ball for a run play. So initially, it looks like the Giants are protecting a lot to prevent uh, the running back from getting stopped behind the line. But as you can see, it's not a run play. Instead, it's a play action, which leads into a very deep drop for quarterback Daniel Jones. And so he's got good protection against a very heavy Steelers rush. And so it looks like they're going to try and throw a deep ball. And after that, it's a perfect deep strike from Jones over the middle to the uh, over the safeties for a touchdown. So what I can see from this play is that the play action was extremely effective in bringing up a lot of defenders and leaving the back end of the defense very vulnerable to a deep strike. And over the middle, it's likely that the Steelers were playing only one safety over the top, leaving their deep threat receiver, Darius Slayton, in a very advantageous position to catch a touchdown. So the conclusions I can draw from this is that the Giants are very, very good at running the play action, that they can throw the deep ball very well, and that Darius Slayton is the best target over the middle when throwing it deep. So now when we look to the statistics, I want to see whether those throws over the middle are really that effective. And this data table shows Daniel Jones' directional passer rating in various areas of the field. So this in the so it goes from the short left to the short middle to the short right, then the deep left, deep middle, and deep right. And so you can see that the passer rating is the highest over the deep middle at 158, which is ridiculously high compared to his short left, middle, and right accuracy, and even anywhere else over the deep areas of the field. So this means that my claims are right and that the Giants should be much more aggressive on offense than they actually were last year. And so I want to try and find a game plan that works to that aggression over the middle. And to be able to synergize those findings into a concept, I need to think about how I can create an actual concept on the field that will work to these strengths. And to me, the perfect strength to use is the flood is the flood concept which is a concept that uses three receivers on one side and one receiver on the other side to overload the defensive coverage on one side leaving one receiver wide open over the middle the giants signed kenny galladay in the offseason who's a big tall receiver who's great at making contested catches and for me he's the best option to be the one exposed over the middle to catch those one-on-ones and the short route can be used for the running back Saquon Barkley, who is exceptional at taking short passes or short runs 
for much more than the defense bargained for. So I think that the flood concept, especially with Kenny Galladay and Saquon Barkley back in the mix this season, could be extremely effective for this Giants offense. And actually, to just wrap it up, my claims were proved correct in their first two games of the season. The Giants were extremely effective at attacking the perimeter, and they were not at all good at attacking the short middle with the running game. And once they got to the outside more and, and attacked these perimeters, the Giants were able to find much more success on offense. So that wraps up my presentation, and you can find the full written game plans at my website, uh, which is linked here at the bottom of the screen. And now I'd like to open it up for questions. Well, Abhishek, thank you so much for that great, great presentation and hard work. I'll invite the audience to drop questions. And while you think about your question, I'll also briefly introduce um, our judge here, Andrew Smith. Um, Andrew, um, can you join the stage for a moment? Um, all right. It seems like Andrew, oh. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm Andrew. I am a fourth year PhD student in the marketing department at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have a wide set of research interests that I guess loosely falls under the category of interpersonal dynamics. I've done research on help seeking, uh, delegation, uh, brand attachment, and emotion. Um, and I'm looking very much forward to seeing the rest of the presentations and Avi, great job on your presentation. Got it. Thank you, Andrew. So um, any questions from the audience on Avi's presentation? So while others are thinking, Abi, I was fascinated by the very topic, like statistics and sports and combining those two. Can you say a few words, how, what inspired you to work on this project? Well, really, at, at the end of the day, it's just my love for the sport. Football is my favorite sport to watch and to play with my friends. And a lot of the time when people are talking about football, especially internationally, they talk about how the game moves so slowly and it doesn't really have that same pace as something like soccer does. But to me, that's what makes it more interesting. It's more of a chess game in that way. You have to plan everything out very carefully. And in essence, better game planning can win you games instead of just having the best athletes, just the best athletes in the sport. If you plan very well, which the Giants have done before in previous seasons to win Super Bowls as massive underdogs, you can win games with the planning. And that's why I feel like this aspect of the game is so much more important than it might initially seem. Got it, Abby. Um, any other questions? If not, I have one more. Um, what was the hardest part of the project? Honestly, um, the NFL is very, very stingy with how you have to access the gameplay and like uh, game film. So finding the actual tape to work with and um, base my claims off of was very difficult, as well as kind of figuring out concepts that already existed that could fit the mold of what I was using for my, uh, for my game plans. Abi, thank you so much. I believe there's a question in, in the in the chat, but we have to move on in the interest of time. Please answer the question in the chat and please drop the website link as well so others can easily click on it and explore. Thank you, Abi. Thank you. Um, so next up will be Yusef. So Yusef is um, from Hillsborough High School, from Hillsborough, New Jersey. And uh, Yusef, uh, we are excited for your presentation. Please share your screen and get started. Great, we can see it. Please feel free to get started. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right, 
Hey guys, my name is Yusuf Habda Halim, and just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from Hillsborough High School, and I am now studying mechanical engineering at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, actually, in my dorm room right now. And this is a project that I've been working on for the past year now. It's called Auto Melter, and it's a device that I built with my mentor. Um, so before I get uh, to talk about uh, what it is, I'll first talk about why it even is important and what, what the problem is in the first place. Um, so after there's this, uh, I'm from New Jersey, so there's there happens a lot of snowstorms there. And after snowstorms, there are um, three options to clear snow off of your driveway, which is shoveling, uh, electric snow plows, or having a heated driveway. And um, I personally didn't have uh, didn't have an electric snow plow or a heated driveway, so I had to shovel snow off on my own, and it was really tedious. Um, I didn't like it. Uh, so basically, shoveling snow was cost efficient, but it was time consuming and really tiresome. Uh, having an electric snow plow, on the other hand, was super time efficient, but it was really expensive. Snow plows start at around four thousand dollars, and I didn't have the money to buy that. And the last option is having a heated driveway which is super time efficient, but again, super expensive, and it's really hard to fix if it breaks because it's installed under your driveway. Um, now, my device that I invented fixes all of these issues uh, because it works automatically, or you can use it manually through a push of the button on your phone, and it costs only $200. Uh, so it, it's kind of like the best of both worlds where it's automatic, but it's also cheap. Um, so this is what a driveway model looks like, and I'll get into how it works specifically later on in the presentation. But basically, this is a, a tank that has a specific solution, and um, when the sensor sense that there's snow outside, uh, the solution would flow into this tube and then into these two pipes. And these pipes have holes that are facing this way, and the solution would basically flow onto the driveway and this solution prevents the snow from sticking on the driveway in the first place. Uh, now, there's another reason why Automelter is uh, a pretty cool device. So according to the US Department of Transport, there has been around uh, 2,000 deaths and 140,000 injuries every year due to icy or snowy roads. Um, now, we, we, uh, if you guys live in uh, snowy areas, you know gritters or like snow uh, salt trucks. It's basically trucks that spray salt on the streets after snowstorms to prevent snow from melting and forming into ice. Uh, now, these device, devices are really inefficient. Uh, first of all, because they were designed in the 1940s and they were never updated ever since. Uh, they cost around $100,000 each and they're used seasonally. Um, and uh, they release a lot of greenhouse gases because they have a lot of devices mounted onto the um, mounted onto the vehicle. So there's a lot of um, machines working simultaneously. Um, and yeah, it's it's just a really inefficient device. Now um, another thing about the way Ritter's function is they start moving after snowstorms start. Um, Auto Melter, the way it works is it will clear snow off simultaneously as it starts, not sequentially. And this would be helpful because you you wouldn't have to wait for the snow to stick to the road for the gritters to go out and clear it. It just does it as the snow falls right from when it starts. Now, this is kind of a model that I drew. I'm not the best artist out there, but this is kind of a model of what it would look like if you tried to put it on the street. So you would have a water tower that has the solution inside of it. And it would work the same exact way that a water tower works. It would be somewhere up high, and the solution would flow down the tubes, and it would go down pipes along the sides of the road. That kind of looked like the first model, but the, the, the holes would be facing the street from either side, and the solution would be just getting pumped into the street. And that would prevent snow from sticking onto the road in the first place, and thus decreasing the death and injuries that happen due to icy roads. Um, so now let me get into how the device itself actually works. So um, there is there are uh, two sensors on the device. So there's a temperature sensor and the precipitate sensor. And they both work simultaneously to sense the presence of snow. So whenever it is less than zero degrees Celsius and uh, whenever the precipitate sensor senses that there's precipitate out there, then that means that there's snow. 
And if there's no that sig that the signal is sent to the Arduino, and Arduino is basically a small chip that functions as a as a small computer, basically. Um, and that Arduino uh, opens the electric valve that's on the tank, and that lets the solution flow outside of the tank. And uh, the uh, the valve is connected to a T-shaped uh, pipe that has holes on it, as I mentioned before, and this lets the um, solution flow onto the driver or onto the streets. And when I was building this, I divided the project into four subsections. So there's the electronics part, there's the coding, and there's the physical build and the mobile app. So the first part is the electronics. Now, this is what I started out with. Um, and this is basically, this. Uh, can you guys see my cursor? I'm not sure. Um, but this is basically the Arduino over here. And this is the breadboard that connects all the wires together to the Arduino and the relay module. These two over here, these are relay modules and a relay module is basically an on off switch. So whenever uh, the Arduino sends a signal to the relay module to turn on or off the, um, the valve, that's basically the on off switch that turned or on or, uh, on or off the valve. And this over here is a precipitate sensor. This is the temperature sensor, and this is a water heater to keep the water that's that uh, to keep the solution that's inside the tank uh, heated all the time. This also makes uh, the whole process a lot easier because um, it would uh, drop the freezing point of the solution. Now, this is what the code looks like. I will explain it more in flowchart because it's easier to do it that way. Um, so this first flowchart uh, explains how the water boiler works or the water heater works. So if I choose to turn the water heater on from my mobile app, then it will turn the water heater on instantly. And if I choose to turn it off, it will turn the water heater off instantly. Now I can choose to do this the automatic way, which is um, there's the uh, water temperature sensor. And if the water temperature is less than zero, zero degrees Celsius, then that will turn the water heater on. But if it's more than zero degrees Celsius, it will turn it off. And I also have an upper bound, so the water doesn't get way too hot. So if the water temperature is more than uh, 20 degrees Celsius, it will turn the heater off. And if it's not, then it will turn it on. Um, now, you can either choose to do the automatic or the manual way. Both of them work perfectly. There's another flow chart here. Uh, there's one um, where th this one is for the valve uh, and how the valve works. So you need the air temperature and the precipitate uh, sensor to both say that there's snow outside and that will turn the valve on. Or if, if none of these uh, two conditions are met, the valve will be turned off. And you can also choose to do the manual way using the mobile app. So if it says yes, if you choose to turn the valve on from your mobile app, it will turn the valve on instantly. If you choose not to, then it will turn it off instantly as well. You so said, um, so um, there are just maybe one or two minutes left. So if uh, you could summarize, that would be wonderful. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that is basically the last slide over here. Um, so yeah, this is the physical build. I showed this earlier in the slide. So this is the electric valve. These are the width of the um, holes. And yeah, this is the physical build. And this is basically the mobile app. It's super straightforward. This is the um, Wi-Fi module. You connect this to the Arduino. It allows you to connect the Arduino to your phone. And you, you just use this mobile app to basically um, do whatever, to control the device however you want. It's super simple and super straightforward. Yep, that's all I had. Thank you so much. Well, Yusuf, I think I speak for everyone when I say that. When it, when you say it's super simple and super straightforward, it certainly doesn't seem that way from from the outside. It's very impressive. Did, did you build all of this by yourself? Yes, I did. Well, congratulations on putting this together. Um, I do have a bunch of questions, but let let's ask the audience um, questions from the audience. And again, uh, I see people who are ready to join the stage. Sonal and Esra, do you want to ask questions? If yes, just let me know and I'll pull you into the stage. So, Andrew is asking a question. 
Hi. So I apologize ahead of time if you already said uh, what I'm about to ask you the question about. I have ADD, so like sometimes I'll just like zone out for a couple seconds. Um, did you like test the mixture that you proposed to make sure that it wouldn't have any undue effects on certain certain types of roads or like tires or um, other things? That's a great question. I did test it on my driveway. Um, and I did uh, try and go up and down the driveway with my car to see if uh, it would affect how the car drives. Obviously, I wasn't able to go like high speeds on the driveway because it's a driveway. Uh, but it didn't feel any different. Uh, now, I what unfortunately I wasn't able able to try it on an actual road, and that's because I would need uh, a permit or some sort of. Uh, I would have to talk to a, a, a government official to get like permission to do that and. It, it, it was a really long pl process that I wasn't able to do. So unfortunately, no, but it, um, from the research that I've done, um, this liquid doesn't really affect rubber. So it shouldn't be affecting tires and it doesn't affect the environment in any a negative way. Youssef, thank you very much for the presentations. If there are additional questions, please ask in the chat and Youssef will be getting back to you. Um, yeah, so thank you, see Youssef. Um, with that, we will move on to our next speaker. It's Aman um, from Caesar Rodney High School. Uh, Aman, please join the stage. And by the way, uh, I hope the way I say your high school and the, the high school itself is correct. If not, please correct me. Um, yes, that was correct. Thank you. So, Aman, so then please share your screen. I was having a little bit of difficulty, but um, yeah. Okay, I think I got it. Wonderful. Great. Okay. I see and hear you, so I'll yield the stage. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. And my name is Aman Rather, and I'm excited to share to you my presentation regarding a review of the recent progress in the field of synthetic immunology. So synthetic immunology is a field in which researchers design constructs that will help the immune cells in our body battle pathogens, most commonly cancer cells. For, uh, this is important due to the many ways that invaders for our body have to mitigate the effectiveness of our immune system. For this subject, the cytotoxic T cell is the most important type of immune cell to be modified, as these cells sense antigens, which are foreign substances that trigger an immune response towards a pathogen, then bind to the infected cell and actually uh, kill it. These cells require the most synthetic changes to actually be able to eradicate the tumor. So a simple diagram of this can be seen on the left side here, where you have uh, your T cell, and it's sensing the antigen on this cancer cell. Um, in this diagram, it's in the form of a yellow dot. However, in real life, an antigen can take uh, the shape of many forms, most commonly proteins and peptides. Um, over on the right, you have uh, a diagram of lymphocytes, which are our white blood cells, and they can differentiate into T cells and B cells. However, um, B cells are most commonly used for producing antibodies to help our immune system, and T cells have many different subsets. But like I said, for uh, this particular topic, the cytotoxic T cell is the most important as it destroys the virus infected cells and kills the tumor cells, and it needs the most enhancements to be able to do so. So as of right now, the most basic type of construct that has been inserted into T cells to make them more efficient is are known as chimeric antigen receptors, or CARs for short. These allow T cells to more effectively attack a single cancer in order to eliminate it from the bloodstream. Um, a diagram of this can be seen on the left side here. Um, this is the CAR T cell structure. Um, over at the top, you have your antigen, um, which is this blue circle here. And then you have something known as a single cell variable fragment. This allows the T cell to actually be able to bind itself to the antigen and sense it. And then when the antigen is sensed, it activates a series of domains, which activates the T cell and allows it to perform its function of killing the infected cell. Um, however, even these receptors face serious issues that prevent them from successfully eliminating cancer cells. Um, as you can see on this diagram over here to the right, uh, the first issue we have is cross-reaction bystander cells. This happens when the target tumor cell shares an antigen 
with a normal cell. In this diagram, the antigen is represented by this red circle over here. And so basically what happens is when the CAR T cell tries to attack this tumor cell, it also attacks the bystander cell because it can differentiate between the two as they both have this circle antigen. Um, another issue we find is known as the hyperimmune response. This happens when a surplus of cytokines are released. Um, cytokines are signaling proteins that are actually helpful um, in the immune response. But what happens is when too many of them are released, it can actually be harmful. And uh, a final type of issue that we find is known as a suppressive tumor microenvironment. And this refers to the types of ways that tumors have to um, not allow CAR T cells and other immune cells to actually perform their function. Uh, this, uh, examples of this include cell death ligands, which are signals that the tumor cell sends, um, and that tells the CAR T cell to actually kill itself. And we obviously don't want that. Um, another example is uh, physical barriers, which prevent the CAR T cell from actually being able to eradicate the tumor. Um, some solution, there are several solutions that researchers have found to this. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just describe the one I found to be very interesting, which are kill switches. Um, these are in, uh, inserted into CAR T cells in case there arises a time in which engineered cells need to be shut down completely due to a potential safety risk. So as you can see here on the diagram to the left, this T cell, it has the CAR circuit just as I, show, just as I showed on the previous slide. But what's unique is it also has a kill switch inserted into it. Um, this kill switch is con controlled by a user-defined drug. This means that researchers can choose a drug and when it's inserted into the bloodstream, it will activate this kill switch. Um, the kill switch actually consists of something called a caspis, which is a human enzyme important in cell killing. So what happens is when this T cell recognizes this user drug, it will induce, uh, the caspis will actually combine and actually activate, and you will have suicide of this engineered cell. And like I said, this is important in case these cells need to be shut down due to a safety risk if they're not performing right in the way that they were engineered to. So this leads us to a question. Could there be a receptor with more advanced capabilities as compared to CARs? And our answer to this question is synthetic notch receptors, short, uh, in short form called syn notch receptors. These have more general applications as compared to CARs because they have something called, uh, known as a user-defined transcriptional program. This gives them broader uh, capabilities in terms of what they can control. So as you can see here in this diagram to the left, it's a basic uh, structure of a syn notch receptor. Um, it's really similar to the CARs. However, like I said, it controls a user-defined program. Um, this can lead to many things, including CAR expression, control of cytokines and antibodies in the body, and others. Um, one example of this system in use that I found to be really interesting was syn notch uh, being used to control T cell differentiation. So over here, you have two different types of T cells in this diagram. Th1 cells and Th2 cells. Um, the Th1 cells produce the cytokine IFN and the Th2 cells produce the cytokine IL-4 and they are controlled by the transcription factors Tbet and GATA3 respectively. So what researchers have actually found is that Th1 cells are more effective in tumor clearance based on their properties and the cytokines they produce. Um, normally, however, without syn notch, an equal amount of D cells are produced in the body. However, researchers have used syn notch in this uh, bottom part right here to uh, skew the distribution of T cells towards the Th1 type uh, based on the transcription factor that the syn notch can induce. And this is really helpful because it allows researchers to control the types of T cells we have in our body. And obviously that is something that, you know, can be really helpful in terms of cancer clearance. Aman, uh, just heads up, maybe one minute left. Oh, sure. Sorry. So uh, the final thing that I found to be really interesting is the combinatorial antigen recognition. Um, this is the syn notch uh, receptor I mentioned combined with the CAR receptor. And this allows uh, T cells to recognize combina combo, uh, combinations of antigens. And this is important because as you can see in this diagram to the left, um, uh, tumor cells sometimes have two types of antigens, whereas the normal cells in our body can have one. And so we need a specific system that only attacks the tumor cell as opposed to the bystander tissue. And uh, using syn notch and CAR in combination has proven to be very helpful. Um, there are other tools that can be uh, syn notch CAR T cells can be used for, but in the interest of time, uh, I'll just pass on. Um, so just to conclude, uh, synthetic immunology is a really interesting field 
And um, I really feel like throughout my project, I developed a passion for learning more about its potential possibilities. Um, currently, it's being used to treat various cancers, including mesothelioma, glioblastoma, and latent HIV. Um, as of now, I submitted a review paper uh, for publishing to the Journal of Student Research regarding this field in totality with uh, the possibility of starting a potential blog to keep track of updates in the field. And I would like to thank the Polygens platform for providing me the opportunity to work on this project, considering the complexity of the field. And I would also like to thank my mentor, Pavathan Ravindran, and he was a great guide through the process of reading papers regarding the information in this field and being able to write my own review paper. Um, and that's it. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Aman. Um, thank you for the great presentation and your uh, hard work. Uh, feel free to um, drop the link for the reference page into the chat. And uh, question time. So if anyone has questions, feel free to join the stage. Request joining. You can uh, request accessing the stage, top right corner, or just to drop your question in the chat. If while people are formulating their questions, so Aman, you talked about the kill switch, and I thought that was a very intriguing concept. And you mentioned that it's a human enzyme that activates it, but I didn't quite understand what would like switch on the human enzyme itself. Yeah. Um, so that would actually be a user defined drug. So what researchers have done is they've uh, synthesized the system where the kill switch activates based on a drug and they can control the type of drug that they, uh, there are several different types of drugs that they can use in this system. And so when that drug is in the bloodstream and the T cell senses that drug, that is actually when the kill switch is activated. Got it. Any other questions from the audience? If not, then just one final question. Aman, what was the most challenging part of the project? Um, for me, it was uh, reading the papers and trying to make sense of them because, as I said before starting the project, I had very little knowledge of the field. Um, as I read, I found that uh, all the papers that I was reading to be very interesting, and I found like knowledge that I was learning to be something I found really cool. But it was definitely really difficult to understand the papers. But I feel um, with my mentor helping me and through like a lot of pra uh, practice and focus. I was able to understand and write an effective review paper. Aman, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, sharing with us the fruits of all your hard work. Um, if there are additional questions, please ask in the chat. And at the very end, we'll invite all speakers back to the stage. So there will also be time for some questions then. Aman, thank you again. Thank you. So with that, um, I just wanted to quickly check. So Mirika. Are you here? Uh, you will be the one after the next. And I just wanted to make sure uh, that you also join the um, queue for the moderation panel. Um, but in the meanwhile, um, next speaker will be Avinash Patel from Pinecrest School from Boca Raton, uh, Florida, USA. So Avinash, I'll... Sorry, Avinash, I'm sorry about that. Avinash, I'll invite you to, to the stage right now. Avinash? Yes, yes. Hi, Avinash. Um, great. So I think we can hear you. Please share your screen. Of course. Oh, sorry. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. So please feel free to start and I'll leave the stage. OK, great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Avinash Patel, and my presentation is on Amazon Review Sentiment Analysis. And my mentor was Anav Sood. So my presentation and research has a lot to do with artificial intelligence, but specifically a subset of it called Natural Lang Language Processing, or NLP. What NLP is, is that it's the combination of artificial intelligence and linguistics that allows us to talk to machines as if they were human. 
So, you know, obvious examples of this in our daily world are Alexa, Siri, Cortana, or any of these, you know, technologies that allow us to talk to it physically. And it is one of the most rising fields of artificial intelligence and technology right now. And in the future, uh, the amount of analyzed data touched by, you know, these cognitive systems will grow by a factor of 100 to about 1.4 zettabytes, which is an absolutely enormous amount of data. So it's a very important field that, you know, is recognized in today's, you know, innovations. And one of the reasons that this is the case is the invention of Google's BERT uh, technology. So in 2018, Google invented a technology NLP known as BERT, and it was the first ever sort of bi-directional and completely unsupervised technique for language representation. So the reason why BERT was so great in terms of, you know, this talking mechanism and understanding texts and human communication was that it, was, it had the ability to understand context better than um, lots of other softwares at the time. So, you know, when we talk, we use certain words accordingly based on the context of the sentence. And BERT's system was a much more efficient man, had a much more efficient way of, you know, decoding context so it could understand humans and give a valid response back. And on top of that, it was an open source, you know, algorithm and machine so that, you know, people can constantly, like Wikipedia, you know, they could constantly go to it and apply edits to it and make it a better system, uh, you know, every single day. And in the span of three years, Bert um, went from, you know, being non-existent to now powering almost every single English-based query on Google search. So it's a very powerful and important tool that Google uses to essentially run its entire business. So some of the general uses of NLP and BERT that you know my uh, research and project focuses on is in the retail industry, specifically when targeting things like user reviews. So you know on things like Amazon, on Walmart, or on online websites, you know users leave reviews for their products. And so what the software, what NLP and BERT do, is that they help highlight user reviews that give you know very comprehensive and useful perspectives, so that they could um, later on you know, figure out what these reviews can be in the future and then assist retailers and manufacturers in, you know, allocating their resources better when producing new products. And essentially retailers can have a better understanding on which products to advertise considering that, you know, these algorithms can go through reviews, figure out the viable ones and give um, Amazon and Walmart and other retailers more insight into their products. So that's the main sort of theme and focus of my program is essentially building algorithms that replicate the process of going through reviews and, and predicting the rating based off of the text review. So this is an example of what the data would look like. Uh, so I see on this right column, this is the actual full text review that someone um, would theoretically live, leave on Amazon. And to the left is the predicted rating that this review would get. So this is the data that I later inputted into my machine learning system and that would produce a output of a rating. So the artificial intelligence model that I had to base my program, program on is called a supervised learning model. So if you don't know much about machine learning, I have this flow chart on the right here that explains it pretty well. Um, so machine learning is divided into the subsets of supervised and unsupervised learning. So I chose to make a model that was based on supervised learning because the data that's provided has an input being the text review and an output, which is the rating already. It's not like you just have inputs and you're making the outputs you have the outputs and you're essentially making a predictive model that you know, predicts and shows the likelihood of your program guess, quote unquote, guessing the review that a person, the rating that a review would leave in the future. And then on top of that, you could divide supervised learning into further categories of classification and regression. So the model that I approached was a classification. And so it would take the text data and then classify it into a rating of you know, one, two, three, four, five. So that's essentially what that means. And then the rest of the steps here are going to be explained in further slides with you know, code so we could actually, or you, so you could actually uh, analyze it in a programming for, sort of format. So the first step of the data that I had to use is balancing and normalizing data. So when I first got the data set that included you know, all those text reviews and ratings, it was enormous. It contained almost, you know, 3 million reviews, which is obviously an enormous amount to, you know, track down and analyze. And on top of that, 
the data was heavily skewed towards people who gave reviews of you know four and five, so higher ratings than lower ratings. And this presents some problems when making an artificial intelligence model because if you if your data is not split evenly and there's a lot of data that's biased towards five and fours, you're making your AI model biased so that in future data it would have a higher chance of un, um, of making an incorrect prediction because the model is biased. So what I had to do was I made a much, much smaller subset of my data being, you know, I chose 5,000 and then split that accordingly into five pieces of, you know, 1,000 people who left a zero or a one and then 1,000 people that left a one, a two, a three and a four. So that when I traded my model, it would get an equal representation of all these reviews so that there would be no inherent bias when making future predictions. And this is obviously a very important step in most AI models that I had to also implement when, you know, making my idea. So then comes the splitting of the data. So you take those, so I mentioned that, you know, I had split the data from, you know, 3 million into 5,000 as a subset. And what you do with that was in order to actually evaluate your data in a machine learning model, you have to split it into things called training sets, validation sets, and testing sets. So what these are is that when you split something into from you know your full data set into training and not training, which is this first line here, you feed that training data first into your model so it could actually into your you know BERT in this case, which is the you know trainer, and that creates the specific artificial intelligence model needed to then test your testing data as it's you know adequately named, um, you know for further prediction. So that's what this essentially does here. And in most supervised learning you know, projects, it's very important because you need a means of taking all the data you have and then understanding and you know, creating a good ratio as to how much data you want to give your model to train versus test. So yeah, this is a you know, various, again, like the last part of normalizing, it's a very essential step of machine learning models. Um, the next step was, so now that you have all your data split and ready and normalized, you actually have to load it into the BERT technology. And so the thing that I had to learn the hard way was that I tried once inputting all the data at once into BERT and that created a heavy inefficiency. BERT couldn't um, run the data all at once. So I had to create this thing in Python, which is the language I used to program this, into something called a data loader. And what the data loader does is that it takes that 5,000 know, pieces of input data and splits them into very small packages of data. So I chose you know, eight as the number of input data that would be per package. And inputting the package data into BERT that way, instead of all at once, was a much more efficient process since BERT could fully you know, make predictions and model off of the data in smaller packages than all at once. So it was just a huge factor of efficiency that I had to learn and program for the BERT technology. And then finally, it came the time to take that testing data that I mentioned before and then you know, train that into the BERT model. Now the actual cycle of training and testing is called an epoch in BERT. And so this, this code below represents the entire process of how you're supposed to load data in and how it's supposed to you know, return your data in terms of you know, how inefficient it was and how correct its predictions were in terms of you know, predicting the eventual rating that the text data would get. Um, yeah, so that's the process of developing the data into BERT. So when these epics actually ran uh, five times, which is the amount of uh, times that you know cycles it ran of the code, it eventually led to statements like this. So the main thing to focus on in the epoch results are these two lines here. If you, if you can see my cursor, which can you see my cursor? If anyone yes. Can? Okay. So it says training loss and then training accuracy. So loss essentially represents you know, the, the error that your model generates. And as you can compare from the first epoch to the fifth one, the error decreases significantly. Because as it runs, um, as the BERT technology runs through your models more, it's able to you know, receive more data and make a, you know, a better prediction per cycle. So that way your loss is minimized as much as it can throughout the five cycles. And your accuracy, which starts at around 38.7%, you know, jumps all the way to around 89.1%, which is a much more, you know, valuable measure or, you know, valuable prediction percentage as, you know, 38 in the first epoch. So this is, this is essentially why the importance of running, you know, more than one epoch is necessary because in the, in only one run alone, say if I only did one epoch instead of five, 
it may have not given me the most adequate percentage, whereas, you know, doing more gave me a much finer look at the, you know, predictive score of the machine learning model. Avinash, uh, uh, there might be maybe just one more minute, so if you could... Yep, uh, almost, right. almost finished. And then, so this is just a graphical representation of what I just explained. As you can see, the loss from training and validation, um, you know, generally when the training data validation loss went down generally, a downward trajectory, whereas accuracy had a much more upward trajectory, which is the outcome that I was really looking for. And I'm glad I was able to achieve through a lot of, you know, experimentation and, you know, editing and revising code. And so the conclusion of this and, you know, future assessments that I could, you know, uh, derive from the data and this project was um, that the accuracy of the rating prediction increased per epoch, indicating that BERT's model's effectiveness uh, was, was actually, you know, working and that it generated a, you know, pretty valuable result. And some future assessments could be, um, you know, sometimes people don't want to, don't want to review, you know, numerical reviews like one, two, three, four, or five. They just simply want to know if a review was positive or negative. So how, you know, I could incorporate that into the model is something that I could, you know, assess in the future and then implement. And then of course, you know, tweaking the number of epochs and how much the data is split and normalized can, you know, give a much higher accuracy in the future towards how efficient this model could be. And I believe that is it. Thank you. Avinash, thank you very much for your great presentation and obviously um, exciting work that you've done. Um, any questions from the audience? And feel free to join the stage. Um, I also see that we have some new people asking to join the stage. Uh, you, uh, th did you want to join? Okay. Um, so I'll just remove everyone who is asking to join the stage and please request if at this point you would like to join and ask a question to Avinash. Uh, and while you're requesting to join to ask your question, I'll ask my question. Avinash, um, you mentioned that you need to um, divide the data set into training and testing. What was your guideline for that split? Uh, the guidelines being, you know, like, can you um, explain more about like what you meant by guidelines? So like, how did you s decide what the ratio should be between training and um, and uh, testing data sets? Okay, so no so normally when you're, you know, making training testing models, the majority of data goes into training because the model needs the majority of the data to actually create itself. And the testing data can, you know, just be a, a smaller percentage because it could work off of a smaller amount of data once a model is generated. So typically you, you wouldn't want to allocate the majority of your data towards testing. It's more towards training and building a model first. And then, you know, just through testing the model more and more, I so I initially had a ratio where it was 50-50, but then I realized that, you know, allocating more towards training and a little less towards testing created, you know, higher efficiencies in the model. So it's, it's a lot of um, trial and error, but also knowing the fact that training data is where a lot of your input data should go towards. Got it. So we have a question from you at Are you joining? Let's see. Well, yeah. Uh, you're muted. Please unmute. Let me. Yep. Um, can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, there should be a little microphone icon just below your image that you need to click. Or feel free to ask the question via the chat. Um, yeah, we, we can't hear you. So uh, if you could ask the question in the chat, that would be great. All right. I'll, uh, so, um, Avinash, uh, one more question. What was the most challenging part of the project? Um, the most challenging part was in you know, the actual learning of the Python components. So uh, before this, I mainly programmed in Java and C. So Python, uh, which is the code that I used, was a whole new experience. So it was obviously simpler because I knew the basic fundamentals of programming, but you know, understanding the 
specificities of you know just normal Python from you know artificial intelligence Python was definitely challenging. But once you know I got the hang of it and learned how to you know program the correct syntax, it became a very very um, fun and um, really rewarding thing to actually create. Great. So um, I believe you is trying to join again. Let's see if we can hear him now. Yeah. Can you unmute yourself, please? All right. It seems like we have some challenge here. So um, I'd like Avinash. Thank you again for your presentation, for your hard work and sharing this with us. So presenters, if you're still here and I understand we are almost over time or we are actually over time, but Yusef, Abi and Aman, if you could join the stage for a moment, we'd like to celebrate all of you. Abi is joining. Um, Yusef um, and Aman, are you here? Aman is joining, wonderful. Um, Yusef? All right, Yusef might have actually a new batch of presentations are starting. So Yusef might have popped off, which is always fine. I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate our speakers in this session and celebrate all the hard work they have done and the presentation they put together to share their learnings with us. Thank you so much. And it's really inspiring to see that we're digging so deep and uh, getting so um, invested in your project. And I believe that this is really pointing towards the promise that you have in your academic careers ahead of you. And um, from the audience, uh, well, please join me in applauding uh, Avinash, Abi, and Aman uh, for their amazing work. And uh, please feel free to reach out to them. I, we know you have a lot more questions and they have a lot more to share. And uh, let's celebrate together all they have uh, achieved here. So uh, as Andrew is saying in the chat, congratulations, great job. Um, and uh, yeah, let's keep the discussion going. So with that, I'll just um, move to public service announcements. So we have a bunch more very exciting sessions happening in both in the humanities as well as the STEM, uh, as well as in STEM. And we have from 11 o'clock, John Gardesi talking about um, how, polyg uh, how polygens projects can really help with college readiness and college applications and admissions. And uh, so feel free, well, I encourage you to attend uh, John Gardese's talk or any of the other talks. There are, there are also networking sessions happening. And then obviously there will be a closing cer a ceremony. So thank you again for joining. Enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Great.